This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Project. One. Bingo, we're back for the four o'clock rock here on a Wednesday. And of course, we're talking about energy. And today we have two energy stars among us. Maria Tomei, energy star. <laughs> Rich Yu, sure. energy star. Okay. You guys are great. Huh? Thanks for coming down. Thanks for coming back. Yeah. You may be asking why I say coming back, because they were both away. They went to the Nelha Conference on Trends and Opportunities uh, in Energy Storage. And if you didn't know, this will be on the final exam. If you didn't know, Nelha stands for the Natural Energy Laboratory of Hawaii Authority. Perfect. Right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, it's, that's in Kona, just near the airport. Right. Okay, and so they went to a conference there, and this show is to report to the guys in Oahu who didn't go to the conference about the conference. Okay, so why did you go? Well, first of all, I had to go because I was <laughs> a panel chair for the hydrogen panel. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> and put the whole panel together, and so I had to moderate the panel. So, but also, uh, it's a great opportunity to network and uh, tell people what you're doing. And of course, I was also able to uh, give them a tour of my hydrogen station. Which at is Nelha, at Nelha. Which is at Nelha, correct. Yeah, a moment about Nelha. Um, I, was, I was on the board of Nelha back in the early oh, were 2000s. You? No yeah. wow. And I saw a lot of action there, a lot of development action, yeah. science. About it, right. fact. So it was organized back in the, in the Ariyoshi days, I think, uh, to be an energy laboratory. And Dan and Owe supported it a lot. Yeah. And caused certain uh, you know projects, including the Gateway right. Energy Center there on the yeah. Mamalahoa Highway, uh, to be built, and um, and it has um, a thousand acres of leasable land, state land, which can be used as a kind of energy park. Uh, there are things that are not completely energy in there, but it's um, it's it's clearly a worthy adventure for yeah. the for the state to be running a kind of tech park like that. Yeah. Okay. Why did you yeah. go, Maria? Well, energy storage is an important part of our energy future, and there are all sorts of interesting things happening, and they had some excellent speakers, not just from Hawaii, and of course Hawaii is where a lot of the good things are happening, but also from the national labs. So there were, uh, NREL was represented, Sandia, um, Argonne, oh, and the, one more. The big companies so, coming yeah. in there. Y yeah, so the national labs are doing a lot of this research, and so, you know, they're busy, um, figuring out the details of how to make the technologies better and there are other parts of the labs that are looking at the big picture internationally what's happening where and how can it all come together and those folks were here in Hawaii so I kind of had to go. NREL, it, it sounds like uh, sort of a, a national version of HNEI, isn't it? Yeah, some yeah. people confuse the same about. kinds yeah, of things. Exactly. Yeah. Except they have a lot more budget and a lot more people <laughs> oh, okay. than we do. <laughs> You and should talk to them every day. They don't have then. to fight as hard for their budgets <laughs> as we do. Okay, so um, let's talk about your panel, Mitch. Uh, yeah. The panel on hydrogen. And, um, you know, obviously, um, Nelha would be very interested in hydrogen. It's all about energy. You have a yeah. facility there. Who did you have on the panel? Uh, first of all, I had uh, Steve uh, Szymanski from NEL Hydrogen. They, he's, they used to be Proton Energy, but they got acquired by NEL out of Norway. So now they're the world's largest uh, electrolyzer company. Um, and it was really great that he was able to come out here to Hawaii. And he's, you know, all our electrolyzers that we are using in Hawaii are from now Nell Hydrogen. Tell them what an electrolyzer is. Oh, great. It's an electrochemical device. You put electricity in, water in, and hydrogen and oxygen comes out. And it does it all quietly. It makes it sound so simple. It is. It's pretty <laughs> simple. Like, you do it in a... Do it in your lab at, at high school. They, have, oh, they always have a hydrogen experiment where they put a pencil in on each side with, and they use the lead as a conductor. And then you make, make hydrogen and oxygen with it. So what's, what new came up in this panel? I mean, what were the takeaways? What was the revelation? Yeah, sure. So first of all, just keying in on the NEL um, um, presentation, they, they've managed to reduce the cost of an electrolyzer by 40%. Think about that. You know, we fight for improvements in efficiency of one or two percent, but on the other hand, because they got this huge monster multi-billion dollar order from uh, Nikolai Motors, who are buying all these big uh, class eight uh, tractor trailer trucks to move beer around the country, 
what a good it's thing. All about beer. So there, part of that deal is is to set up hydrogen stations and a network of hydrogen stations around the country. And so they've um, um, contracted NEL Hydrogen to do that. So in order to meet the demand, they had to go and build a new factory. And because now you're starting to get volume production kicking in, that's where you know you get uh, your economics get a lot better. So they've knocked forty percent off of. Uh, Electrolyzer and this cost. isn't necessarily the technology in the electrolyzer, it's the manufacturing process yeah. to build the electrolyzer. Yeah, because they basically build it uh, in a production line, just like building a car, you know, yeah. and, and put in automation because they're building multiple units. So that was that was a huge deal. Yeah. And then uh, we had uh, Stan Osserman came in and talked about uh, the microgrids they're putting in at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, which is like really innovative technology. So this is all front end stuff. Uh, we had uh, Paul Pontio from Blue Planet uh, Re Research and Development talking about, you know, their battery development and how it's uh, integrated with hydrogen. So you're using your hydrogen fuel cells to keep your battery at a safe level, so you improve uh, the durability of your battery over t time because you're not you're not working it as hard. And so it's a perfect marriage. And in a vehicle, for example, you use the battery to absorb regenerator braking power. You can't use it to generate more hydrogen. So it was a really good fit, and they, they have such an awesome program over at, uh, at um, Blue Planet on the big island at Hank Rogers Ranch. I mean, it's just like world class. I mean, everybody just loves going there. And then finally, we had a... a, a Can I uh, interrupt you a minute? Yeah, sure. So um, Blue Planet yeah. um, actually markets the Sony battery, right? They use the Sony battery, correct. And uh, so, so was Tesla there? What's the comparison? No. Well, it was a great show about uh, Elon Musk on, on 60 Minutes this yeah. past Sunday. He's really something. Uh, anyway, <laughs> the Tesla battery is competing with the Sony battery, so was there discussion of that? Uh, well, the batteries that Blue Planet are making are for stationary applications, so mm -hmm. you don't need the power, you just need the, uh, you need the uh, energy storage part of it. And so it's a totally different lithium ion uh, chemistry, mm -hmm. and it's far safer, actually. Um, it doesn't can, overheat. Well, it doesn't overheat, like, you know, full charging to discharge, it maybe goes up like two degrees, whereas mm, wow. other batteries, you have to actually actively cool it to keep it from overheating. But, you know, they don't get work quite as hard. Um, and the other issue is just straight safety. They, you know, Paul Pontio loves to put on the nail test where they drive a nail through a, a, a lithium ion battery, one through, uh, the uh, Sony battery, we'll call it, as you characterize it, and the other one is through the Tesla battery, and the Tesla battery catches on fire and it eventually explodes. Wow. You can't put it out. Whereas the uh, Sony battery does not catch on fire. It just, you know, releases the lithium. Uh, it has a little valve actually in the cell, and it's very, very safe. One, one point of curiosity here is that every time you see these batteries, in fact, Paul brought some down here. Uh -huh. Uh, at this table right. a year ago, um, is that they're relatively small. And if you go to Kauai and look at the facilities, uh, KIUC yeah. with batteries, you see the batteries uh, for Tesla, for example, they're no bigger than a, than a, a desktop. They're, they're small. Only well, you got to strap together a lot of them. Well, that might have been a module, but you have, I mean, they, they look like flashlight batteries almost. Yeah, you just, but the question I put thou You is, have thousands of them. Are they going to get bigger? Are they getting bigger? As the technology evolves, you know about this, Maria? Yeah, yeah. The technology yeah. evolves about, around this, does it, yeah. is, are we going to get yeah. bigger batteries or are we going to strap together a lot of little ones? I don't know if they really talked about trying to change the design of the basic units. Well, as much as they talked about the chemistry oh, and improving the chemistry yeah. and the efficiencies and the management of the batteries and how they're used and how they're dispatched. Um, you know, I, I assume that if it was more cost effective, safer, or easier to manufacture different sizes, they would, but you can also have a downside of that is then how do you standardize the whole thing? So, you know, there tends to be um, a differentiation and then there's a consolidation again into some basic sizes. Yeah. But they didn't get into that at this conference, so I, I hesitate to say anything yeah. about that. So. The, uh, you know, the Blue Planet guys are using a larger format uh, lithium ion battery now for their big stationary storage uh, uh, product that they're using now. So yeah, they will get into larger format because the smaller ones take that much more work to assemble them. So you eventually want to, you know, scale it up so you don't have to make as many assembly operations and fewer points of failure. So yeah, I know it wasn't at the at the at the conference, but uh, 
We had a show about wind last mm -hmm. last week. Uh, Peter uh, Rosek came down with some guys from the uh, the new wind facility. That's it's in um, it's in RFP shape now, and they're they're trying to make a, a purchase power agreement. Yeah, that. they have a PPA. Uh, it's, it's really uh, ten cents, ten dollars. Make that ten dollars and. Get this right. It's it's like not quite eleven cents. There it is. It's not quite eleven cents for a kilowatt hour. It's pretty good. Yeah, that's for, excellent. For, you know, for renewables. Yeah. And what's interesting about it is particular site. This is interesting because I thought that you always needed batteries. Mm -hmm. Hence the importance of this conference. You always needed batteries for wind, as well as as photo photovoltaic because wind goes down at night, you know, right. and you, you can't get firm power. Right. Um, but in fact, this project is not going to have batteries. This project is in a location. This is in Kahi Point, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, where you don't need it, and they're not having it. And they're going to deliver the, the energy directly to the, um, you know, the generation station there. You know about this. Yeah, I, I think um, I don't want to talk about it too much. You know, for one thing, it's intermittent power. And, you know, and batteries can be added to support, you know, the intermittent power, especially if the ramping is too too fast and whatnot. So just because there aren't batteries or some other mechanism on site to support. Um, oh, so there will know, be batteries at anyway. At some point, something needs to be dispatchable Smooth it. to handle the fluctuations. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so it's a little bit um, oversimplifying to say that it's unique in that that's, sense. That's what I do. Th that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but you were making a point about... Um, something else I think about the batteries or the energy storage. Well, the, 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 the larger size batteries, yeah. the new for the technology of batteries, mm -hmm. and after all, that's what this is all about. You know, it's on trends and opportunities in energy savings with storage. Yeah. Right. So, and I would imagine. Correct me if I'm wrong. You guys went over there, spent a couple of days. Storage means batteries. Not only no, batteries. Not talking about batteries are part of storage. No. So batteries are a part of storage. And there were so many different slides on where batteries fit in the storage options matrix, you know, because you've got pumped hydro, right? You've got batteries, you've got capacitors and flywheels. You talk about all that? Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah. And okay. hydrogen. And hydrogen. Don't forget hydrogen. <laughs> well, hydrogen is a storage mechanism. <laughs> there yes. you go. I sometimes yes. forget that. That's yes. it. That's yeah. it. And you know, then they had a flow battery. That's why you're so important in this conversation. Yeah. Right. So one of the features was they were introducing a new flow battery that was just being commissioned at Nelha with funding from the Office of Electricity. What's a fuel battery? It's uh, kind of similar to a fuel cell, except it has two big tanks of electrolyte. And so you can disassociate uh, your power from your energy storage. And so basically you have this electrolyte, uh, which is a chemical, and it can be regenerated. And I thought the really unique thing about this was because this uh, electrolyte does not degrade over time, what the company is doing is leasing you the electrolyte so that your capital acquisition cost is significantly reduced. And plus, once at end of life, whenever that is, 20, 30 years, they'll take the electrolyte back and recycle it with somebody else or in some other battery. That's, that was pretty innovative, I thought. It was a so very good on the business Leasing you side. electrolytes. Yeah, exactly. Okay, you know, <laughs> new business models coming up all the time. It was a big deal to lease a car, but now electrolytes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. what were you there for, Maria? What were you looking at? What was your point of interest? Well, you know, we need to have some idea of what all is going on and what the various technologies are, and not not only what's happening right now in the developmental side, but also how things are being used. And they had a lot of case studies. There was discussion of everything from the battery technology to the electrolytes and how to improve those, right. to um, what's happening with microgrids, and also how are you pricing things, how are the regulatory issues being addressed, you know, because there's a whole bunch of new development happening. Um, so that, that's kind of what I was there to, mm. to hear. And um, I found it very, very interesting. Were, there, were there young Turks there who were trying to build software to make the grid more efficient. I mean, I would imagine they're, they're always around those guys. Yes. Yeah. yeah, those software people are busy with everything. Do they have any good yeah, products to talk about? Mm, yeah, you know, it wasn't really a sales conference, so you didn't see too much of that aspect. It was more, you know, this is being done, and these are some of the companies active in the area. Uh, good, good, good. So you, 
Yeah. And it was, um, undoubtedly, it was a network experience, am I right? It's yeah, always, actually, always a network it really experience. was. I met some really interesting new people, so. And there's yeah. a benefit, correct me if I'm wrong, to having it in, in Kona at Nelha instead of in Oahu. I mean, what, what would you have preferred, here or there? Oh, me? Well, the benefit was, uh, from my point of view, I was able to show off my new hydrogen station that I just put in to a lot tours of tours and everything. Yeah, gave, well, we had a formal tour of it and talk about it, and they could actually go down and see it, and they were like surprised at how big it was, and you know what the equipment actually looks like was, <laughs> was uh, pretty novel to them. And and even while I was giving a presentation to a group, there was one guy who was putting in a wind farm, and he said, "Wow," he says, "we could really, you know, look at hydrogen and, and tie something that in like this in with our wind farm." So he gave me his card and said, Let, let's talk. So that's a, you know, typical how networking works. So, yeah, there was a lot of that yeah. going on. Well, it's, just part, it's part of the industry, isn't it, that everybody talk to each other because there are yeah. new ideas fomenting exactly. all the time and you, yeah. you want to find out what affects you. Yeah, you don't want to stay yeah. in your cubicle behind your computer screen. It's good to go out and meet people and talk ideas, you know, both during the conference and at night, you know, the networking sessions we have. and and develop relationships. You know, you meet people who are interesting, you get that one-on-one -on -one relationship with them, and then you phone them back in a couple of weeks and, you know, see, and then you start thinking about, well, how can I use what this guy was telling me in some of my projects? And you have your own network where you know there's guys interested in that particular thing, and so you can help them out. Like say, hey, I just saw this great uh, flow battery technology, I know you're kind of interested in that, Here's the guy's card. I've already done that twice. Here's the guy's card and some of his brochures I picked up. So, you know, it helps them want to come to Hawaii if they get a little piece of business out of it at the very end. Otherwise, you know, why come to Hawaii? Mm -hmm. So it's good for Hawaii. It's good for the economy. It's good to get this new technology exposed. And, you know, we're the perfect test site because yeah. our electricity here is so expensive that, you know, this, this emerging technology is still not volume produced, so they can be competitive in Hawaii where on the mainland they might not be able to compete against two or three cents a kilowatt hour, you know, hydropower. Yeah. So that's that's all part of it. And and hopefully they also want to invest in doing projects here, like on the R and D side, development projects. So I was able to tell them about our labs, our capability that H N E I has and all the different areas we operate in. And so that we can try and attract, uh, you know, project money to help HNEI and the state, you know, develop this technology in state and get our kids trained up. It's reaching out. It's and, reaching uh, out. You yeah. can't just sit there passively and let life go by. You got to go out and grab it. Yeah. And uh, and uh, apply it. Yeah. And be a little bit aggressive. You know, yeah. market ourselves like brag a bit and, yeah, and yeah. talk about our, our achievements. And be in a sharing kind of relationship. You know, Aloha means a lot of this kind of conference, yeah. especially when you're trying to establish relationships, one chi with people from other places. Yeah. Let's take a short break. When we come yeah. back, I, I want to ask you to compare this conference with the Germany-Hawaii uh, Clean Energy Symposium sure. what, three weeks ago. Yeah. Mm, okay. See what you think. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. We're going to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Try a little more, hard and every more, let's do what we can. Hey, aloha, Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Okay, we're back with Mitch Ewan and Maria Tome. We're talking about the <clears throat> NELA Conference on Trends and Opportunities in Energy Storage. And I wanted to ask you, you know, the cliffhanger question before the break was, how would you compare this conference with the conference three weeks a month ago with the Germans, the Germany-Hawaii Clean Energy Symposium, is what it was? 
They were slightly different, but actually the quality of the presentations and the people that were presenting was like equal, if you know, about the same. We had really quality people over at the Nelha uh, conference, and the same with the German ones. I was really impressed, and a lot of people were with uh, the, the crack caliber of the presentations and the information that was came out of it. So they were very good, both of them. And what both of them say is that we have a leader, leadership position. We can squander it if we want, but we do have a leadership position. People come from far away to see what's going on here. Right. And maybe learn about it, participate in it, share about it. In both of the, both of the cases, uh, the Nelha conference and the German conference, right. yeah. um, pe they were coming from far away. They were trying to figure out what we do. They see us as leaders. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But we have to keep up the momentum. Absolutely. I mean, we can't oh, just gosh, talk believe, yeah. the talk. We have, actually have to walk the talk, and we have to get things done. I mean, at the front end, when you first start things out, it's maybe relatively easy. But now we're, we're getting through the low-hanging fruit phase where things were you know, relatively easy because, you know, we're inefficient. We haven't changed all our light bulbs out we yet. We didn't know better. We didn't know better. But now as we, <laughs> all the light bulbs are changing out, you know, we, you know we're, it's That's getting, easy. yeah, yeah. But now it's getting a lot harder. And, uh, you know, uh, we all know that budgets are constrained. But at some point, we're going to have to start spending real money on this kind of stuff to make those next steps because it's not free. And, you know, when you're talking about changing your infrastructure, like your grid, that's all expensive stuff. I mean, it's not, it's not free. It just, and, and people, you know, the federal government is not throwing a lot of money out there like we used to have. I mean, not that they threw it out there. We don't have Senator Inouye out there fighting for us. And, you know, because of his seniority, he was able to get lots of things happening in Hawaii. We've got the new administration. And there's been a, a real change in how the Department of Energy now is managing their money. Because their budgets got constrained, now they're focusing on the national lab because, of course, the national labs are the priority. I mean, they're the crown jewels and for the, uh, for the country to maintain this level of uh, expertise and infrastructure. So they don't want that to go away. So all their, the majority of their money is going into that. And it's harder for universities like us here in Hawaii now to get any of this money to support our program. So, you know, things are getting tight. We got to show so them the goods. Yeah. You got to show them the goods. You got to, like I said, you have to walk the talk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how much of what Mitch said do you agree with? Well, I didn't go to the German energy <laughs> conference all the way, so. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The um, other part. But, yeah, but, um, and as far as getting the funding, I, I, I'm not involved directly in that. Right. But um, as far as the momentum being important and the, um, things getting more difficult, you know. I, I think in retrospect, it always seems the successes appear almost inevitable. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you were there working hard to make it happen, you don't realize how much effort went into it. And so you look back and you're like, oh, well, all that stuff was easy. And someday someone will look back and all the stuff we're doing now that we're working so hard True. on, they're going to say, that was easy. <laughs> no, That's the really low hard. hanging fruit. Yeah. Now we really got to work. So I think it's, yeah. it's a constant um, sure. struggle, you know, because yeah. you've got the new and the untested and, you know, the resource constraints. But the, the important thing is to stick with it. Yeah. And so, to remember. Yeah. So, I, you know, Hawaii has a couple of aspects, I think, that are unique. And, you know, in one way, what would be a demonstration or somewhere else to us is big enough to actually be commercial mm -hmm. and important and we really want it because mm -hmm. it makes a difference to us because we are constrained we do have to be self-sufficient we need to be reliable and resilient in a way that other places don't and so we're taking it more seriously perhaps and we're not only further ahead in a lot of the penetration levels that we're seeing but we also have an aggressive goal and we you know so we are taking it much more seriously i think than some other places that are just beginning to think oh wouldn't it be nice to do that right. and so bringing that level of commitment from the hawaii side to the people who on the outside are looking for some place to demonstrate what it is that they've developed i think mm -hmm. is a natural marriage but we have to get out there and we have to make those connections so i'm glad that well, you know you guys are referred to uh, companies that come here uh, big companies that deal in energy i mean yeah. Capital concentrations who have achieved a lot of capital and uh, and they do things that require a lot of capital. Right. But wh where where does the local entrepreneur fit? Um, the guy who has uh, an engineering degree, the guy who um, knows about electrical engineering, knows about solar, he knows about grid development, he knows about 
um, you know, all the equipment. They're hanging well, around at these conferences. <laughs> yeah, where, 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 yeah. If I'm studying this and I want to get in on it, I can't compete head on with these big companies that come from far away. Yeah. I got to find my niche. Mm -hmm. What is my niche? Can you actually, help me with that? There was one thing that hasn't been mentioned and wasn't actually on the agenda, but was in a side conversation. And so Hawaii has a special purpose revenue bond matching program. And so if someone is developing the new technology and they can get the federal government through the SBIR program or STTR program to commit, Hawaii will provide matching funds. And so that's a state program that doesn't get mentioned much. And then, of course, the Energy Accelerator, which is doing a really good or sorry, Elemental Accelerator, Elemental, yeah. that is doing a really good job of, you know, encouraging the companies that are at a certain stage of development. And then, of course, there's whatever Mitch was going to add to that. Yeah, I was going to add a couple other things. Uh, another accelerator that's very good is Accelerate UH, which uh, takes either UH alumni or UH technology and helps to um, uh, bring it to market and uh, what they do is they teach you um, they give you a course actually I took the course it, it, it took like three months and they teach you all this entrepreneurial stuff then they bring in outside experts like lawyers and marketers they teach you how to do, write a business plan how to tune your pitch up and to validate your technology that's the first thing you do in the first week is like you know, you think there's a market, but you go out and prove to me there's a they market. They test so, you on it. Yeah, yeah, you go out and have to interview like 30, 40 people a week and come back with the results. And and in my uh, cohort, as they call it, I mean, several people actually made major changes to their business plan because some of them found out nobody wants what I think is great and neat. <laughs> they want something else. So back to the drawing That's board. That's so you know, important. It's really Design important. Design thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, all right. it's called lean, uh, lean startups, you know, and business canvas yeah. model. They use yeah. very, very good quality program. I mean, I come, from, I come out of industry. I'm not an academic. I mean, I run some publicly traded companies in my time, and I went in there pretty arrogant, like, what can they teach me that I haven't already known? Well, they taught me a heck of a lot that I didn't know, so I'm a big fan. And they're just upstairs here on the 18th floor. Great organization, Sultan Ventures runs it on contract to the university, great program. But I just wanna make one other comment um, to follow up on what I said, what uh, uh, Maria was saying is like, the harder it gets, to get money and funding, the more innovative you have to be. You have to think of other angles and it forces you to be innovative, like the guy who's gonna lease you his electrolyte instead of sell it to you because it helps him sell his market. And so it actually forces you to think, oh well, gee, I got this cash cow and they're just gonna sprinkle money on me, I don't have to work too hard, it's the same old, same old. Now I gotta go out and think harder and uh, make a, a better business value proposition and maybe have to change my product so that everybody's excited now, about it. That's real resilience. That's real it resilience, <laughs> yeah. It's resilience in the marketplace. Yeah, you have to go yeah, out there and attract it, yeah, like yeah, yeah. change the way you do business. So Maria, what, was your, what, what were the panels you liked best and what were the subjects that you, know, you bring back from this conference that you think will change the way we do business. She loved the hydrogen panel. Of course. <laughs> of course <she> <laughs> Great panel. But it's already been talked about. Um, I was very encouraged That's to see right. the local media there. Uh, West Hawaii Today came to cover, there was a panel in the afternoon on the Wednesday, uh, resiliency and force majeure situations such as lava and hurricanes. You know, the folks on Big Island were actually very interested in that and they got a great write up. You know, and they had, they had followed what had been said by the panelists and they reported in the paper. And that's always encouraging because it's where the public is interested in what is happening in the technical and academic and regulatory areas. It doesn't areas. happen all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that, that was something I thought was very fruitful, you know, yeah. outcome of this, yeah, yeah. this um, conference. Um, I also, you know, liked the offers of the modeling, so you know, they've developed these modeling software. How do you quantify the value of these, um, these services? The batteries can provide ancillary services and what, how do you modeling quantify what? that? What are, you, what are you talking, modeling what? Kind so, of modeling so talking what is it, what is an outage worth? If the power goes out, what, what is it worth? To avoid an outage, what is that worth? Mm. What, what, if a one minute hour, a five minute hour. In yeah, the economy. we got to figure this stuff out, right? Yeah. So the services that are provided by whatever it is on the grid, whether it's batteries, pump storage, the available energy, the baseload units, 
we have to value what they're providing because it's different. And so they're modeling these things in a way, and those models are public domain and free. And I, I was jotting down the links, and you know, we have some of them, and we're going to go um, keep an eye on some of the others. Mm -hmm. Because those resources, we don't have to develop them. They've been developed. We can use them. Um, and if we have additional questions, the national labs, you know, they, they may be able to, to help us with the next phase and those questions as well. So you came out of this conference. I, I'm wondering if you came out with any new ideas about storage, about batteries, about where the batteries fit in the grid and in renewables going forward. Is there anything that you took away? My enthusiasm for the energy, the stored energy piece and how it's going to be um, a really effective part of our transition to renewables was um, confirmed. You know, there's so much work being done and improvements being made, not just on the new technologies and the new chemistries, but even on how to use the older technology. You know, one of the batteries that was um, on display at Nelha is a lead acid ba battery, basically, but they've got new stuff in it, and so they're calling it an ultra battery because it's an ultra capacitor in that, you know, and so there are so many new things that are being done that it's very encouraging. And one last thing, liquids are a form of energy, of stored energy. And so very often liquid fuels, you know, are a form of stored energy that need to be added into the discussions. And when you have those charts showing different types of energy storage, I was glad to see that they had a variety of those options in there because we have to look at the costs and impacts of all of them. Okay, how about you, Mitch? Uh, well, one new technology I didn't know much about going in was uh, what they call forward osmosis as opposed to reverse osmosis. So they can use like low-grade heat. The guy was saying, I'll take any heat you're willing to give me to run this system, and it's like you know, 70 80% more efficient. What than does the heat the, do? What, what it draws the fluid through a membrane, and that separates oh, the membrane from the salt water. No, well, no, it's not a fuel cell. This is just... You know, uh, desalination technology. Oh, okay. But de you know, desalination costs a lot of money and uses a lot of energy. And uses a lot of energy. And because uh, we don't, you know, water is starting to get more and more precious here in Hawaii. We don't have as much of it freely available as we used to have. So we're going to have to start looking in some areas of Hawaii where we're going to have to start, you know, desalinating seawater. So this is a really interesting technology, and they're setting it up at Nelha, at the old Sopagee site, which generates heat with their little parabolic mirrors. And they can run it 24-7, because you know, they can run this heating oil and have a big bulk of heat stored, like overnight, so you can run it 24-7. And they're going to use the water that they produce to support Cyanotech who, you know, they have like five... All connected. They have a huge yeah. amount of uh, yeah, fresh of water that evaporates yeah. every day, like three or 400,000 gallons. I mean, think about that. And that's almost like depleting the, uh, the allocation to Nelha. So very interesting technology, interesting pitch. Um, so that was, that was new. Well, it's the mark of a good conference. You let your mind fly. Yeah. You come for one thing and you get much more than that. You get all kinds of thought process and other things. Yeah. I'm glad you went and I'm sorry I didn't go. You gotta go, yeah. Next time. Next year <laughs> if you or can. two years. Yep. We're gonna do it again. Yep. Thank, Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha, yeah. you guys. Aloha. Thanks. <laughs>